guys, and welcome back to another Lost Bits video right here on Tetra Big Gaming, the series where we explore the unused, scrapped, and unseen content in video games. So Pikmin has been a series that's been requested on the channel basically ever since I started making these videos. And with the Pikmin 3 Deluxe port just on the horizon as I'm making this video, I think it's a perfect chance to finally pick some min. And before we get started, if you're playing Pikmin 3 Deluxe or any Switch game on the go, be sure you're playing it in maximum comfort with this video sponsor, Satisfy. They recently sent me over their Zenigrip Pro Elite bundle, which comes with this big boy case, which can hold like 20 games and basically anything you would need to bring on the go. There's also the Zenigrip, which is super easy to attach to a Switch and makes holding the Switch for long periods of time much more comfortable. I gotta say, my favorite thing about it is the grip's ability to double as a stand that feels way more stable than the Switch's kickstand. Satisfy also offers a slim line of cases for those looking to keep a lower profile, and they even have an upcoming clear grip, and if you've been around the channel for a while, you know I'm a sucker for that stuff. Anyways, if you're interested, be sure to use the link at the top of the description and enter code TETRA10 at checkout. This will give you a nifty 10% off your order, which will stack on top of any sales they might have going on. So if you want to maximize your portable comfort and storage, or are looking for a great gift for any Switch owner, be sure to check them out. Anyways, with all of that said, we got quite a few things to pick through, so go grab a Pikmin or two, it's time to find some lost bits. And with that, let's kick things off with some unused graphics. First we got this moon texture that is believed to have been meant to be shown at sunset, and then we also have this set of textures that shows different colors of Pikmin carrying bomb rocks. Now in the game, only yellow Pikmin can carry bomb rocks, so this shows that at some point, more colors were planned to do so as well. Next is what appears to be an early prototype version of the game's banner, as seen if loading the game from the GameCube's menu. I already mentioned the moon texture, but interestingly, there's also this unused screenshot image of a blank blue screen, with the heads-up display as well as that moon texture for some reason. On top of having triple sevens all over, this is actually the heads-up display that is used in several early gameplay screenshots, and based on the moon appearing as part of this heads-up display, it's also theorized that it could have been used for a nighttime clock. Next up, the game also contains a folder titled Carl Texas, which contains several unused textures, including basic stuff like some control sticks, arrows, some backdrop windows, this texture featuring a blue A button, perhaps a remnant from Nintendo 64 development, with the Japanese text on the top translating to Decision, and lastly are several textures of Pikmin, like this set here, as well as these textures featuring Pikmin in the yellow, blue, and red variety. And now moving on to the third dimension, Pikmin also has a few unused models. First up is this guy, known just as Cylinder, and this just appears to be an early placeholder version of the 10 pellets. I was actually able to swap this model in and view it in the game using the debug model viewer, which we'll come back to later in this video. Then next are models Key and Door, which as you'd expect are exactly what they sound like. The key is, you guessed it, used to unlock the door, and surprisingly, the functionality for it is also still intact, as seen in this footage by Debug Yoshi. Basically, bringing a key to a door will cause it to squish down into the ground. For whatever reason though, this mechanic was shelved. Then we have Old Marker, which just as the file name suggests, is an old placeholder version of the marker used to aim where Olimar moves. This marker is much larger than the one that is used in the game, and it features a large crosshair indicating the center where Pikmin will land when thrown, while the outer grey circle here indicates the maximum whistling area. Moving on, the game also has a leftover prototype model of Olimar's ship, the SS Dolphin, as seen in the game's cutscenes. Nothing too crazy, just appears less finished. Then the next two unused models are a pretty strange finding in this game. First is a model of... Mario? This is a very large model, so I wasn't able to swap it into the game like I did with the cylinder, but yeah, for whatever reason, the mustachioed fella is found left over in Pikmin. Shigeru Miyamoto has stated that the famously scrapped Super Mario 128 eventually became Pikmin, so some believe that this Mario model may be a remnant from whatever that game once was. But if you've seen my video on Super Mario 128, you know I'm kinda skeptical that the game really did turn into Pikmin. Anyways, lastly in the same vein, there's also a leftover model of a Goomba listed as Karibo, what Goombas are known as in Japan. 
Interestingly, this model bears a striking resemblance to Kug, the Goomba sprite found hidden underground in Super Mario Sunshine's Pinna Park. Whatever purpose this Goomba model had, I'd be willing to bet it's the same as the Mario models. And while we're talking about unused models, there are actually two unused enemies found in the game, each with their models and even some animations left over. First is Iwa-Gen, which is thought to be a compound of the words Iwa and Gen. Iwa meaning rock, and Gen being short for generator, so rock generator. Iwa-Gen only has one animation in which it appears to be shooting something, probably rocks if the name checks out. It appears like a three-legged vase made of stone with a patch of grass on top. A simple, but still strange design. Then the other unused enemy is known as Usuba. Usuba translates to antlion, so yeah, flying antlions. Sounds fun. It also has an associated animation left in the game for it flying, and some fans have even been able to load it back into the game. Furthermore, these Usuba were apparently developed to have a large amount of health and are believed to have been able to spawn in smoky prog enemies. Next up, Pikmin has a lone audio file that goes unused. This short jingle is believed to have been once planned to be heard when Olimar encounters Pikmin for the first time in the game. Either way, let's have a quick listen. Now, I don't know about you guys, or if I'm just going crazy, but to me it kinda sorta sounds like the treasure chest opening jingle from The Legend of Zelda games. Moving on, Pikmin also has several bits of text that go unused, the most notable of which are some unused voyage logs and a monologue from Olimar. The first unused voyage log was to appear after collecting all 30 of the ship parts in the game. This was essentially Olimar reflecting on leaving the planet and thinking about the Pikmin he was leaving behind. This never ends up used, since the game ends once you collect all 30 ship parts, giving you no time to ever read the log, and reloading the save file after completing the game will just bring you back to having 29 parts once again. The next unused log mentions how Pikmin move around with obstacles in the way, and then the last one here is just a short unused voyage log of Olimar writing, I am so very tired. I can relate, buddy. Anyways, it's believed that this log was meant to be used if the player had failed to get all 30 ship parts by day 30. Then there's also this unused monologue, which just like the one earlier, never gets used since the game ends after collecting the 30th ship part. Here again, Olimar mentions leaving the planet and the Pikmin who have aided him. Okay, and now is when things get spicy here, as next it's time to once again check out some debugging content, and this game has a lot of it. So, in addition to some debug info that can be displayed in the top left of the screen, as well as pretty much everywhere, making it super hard to see, a little debug menu is also left in. Starting from the top, the first option allows you to toggle between two different title screen menus, one with the challenge mode and one without. The next option allows you to choose between 152 of the game's monologues and read them to your heart's content. Then we have a test of the game's save screen, followed by two strange test screens. They both have various bits of text and graphics everywhere and can be panned around, but only the second one allows the user to move around the bouncing five, which also changes colors. I'm not too sure what these screens could have been for other than testing text, sprites, and maybe text animations. Then moving on, the next option allows the user to view all memory card related prompts such as the save file being corrupted or the memory card being incompatible. Then we have test screens for selecting a ship log all the currently unlocked voyage logs, a test of the end of day screen, some pause menus similar to the title screen ones we saw earlier, and finally a test of the final statistics screen. Based on all we've seen here from this debug mode, it appears to have been centralized around text in the game. Next is definitely something I find more interesting than text, and that's a model test viewer that I mentioned briefly in the video earlier. As expected, this allows us to scroll through and inspect several of the game's models, including various enemies, objects, and even a blue Pikmin. Interestingly, however, for some reason I wasn't able to find models of other characters here, like the other colors of Pikmin, or even Olimar himself. Either way, it was still pretty fun to scroll through all the enemies and see all their animations like this. Some of them are, uh, yeah, they're something. Interestingly, found hidden out of normal view is this strange object that changes to a different texture depending on which character is being viewed, some being creepier than others. 
Now, one of the most interesting things I think about Pikmin is that left over in the game is a Windows executable file. What does this mean? Well, basically, although you do need a few extra files to get it working, with files found on the disk, you can actually run Pikmin on a Windows PC. And it comes with a whack load of extra debugging features to boot. These include more debug menus, in-game debug features, dev tools, and more. In the interest of time, I won't be covering these features in this video, and honestly, it could probably make for a whole video just by itself. Also, I'm too much of a chicken to download random DLL files on the internet to get this working, so yeah. Anyways, if you're interested in seeing or learning more about it, I'll leave a link to both the Cutting Room Floor page, as well as the video from Pikmin 526 you're seeing here, down in the description below. And finally, for the last stop of this video, my favorite part as usual, Pikmin has quite a few unused areas, including test maps left over. First up, we have a course listed simply as Roots, and this is thought to be a prototype version of the game's intro impact site stage. Overall, this course looks pretty complete, minus some texturing clearly appearing unfinished. Unfortunately, there's not much else of note here. Before we move on though, we'll often be seeing objects and enemies floating in the distance, but this is actually a byproduct of loading these unused levels over one of the used ones. So basically, since these unused levels only have level geometry and collision left, these objects like boxes, bridges, enemies, etc. appear in places they normally would in the stage that is being overwritten. Yeah, I hope that made some sense. Anyways, next, similar to Root, we have a course listed as Map 6. This appears to be another early version of a stage, this time Distant Spring. The textures here look really rough, and yeah, this course is clearly unfinished. Apparently this is the stage that was used for gameplay in an old E3 trailer for the game, so I assume this was a stage that was whipped up early on in development as a proof of concept of sorts. Also again similar, we have E3 Play 3, and this appears to be an early version of either Forest of Hope or the Impact Site. Based on the name of the course though, this was probably the one stage that was shown off at E3 of 2001. Overall though, nothing too crazy here, so let's move on. Next up we have Code Test, and unfortunately I couldn't get this one to load in with any sort of level geometry. All I saw here at first were just the various objects and enemies as they'd appear in the normal stage I overwrote. That is, until I flew up and saw this strange board thing with a strange texture. Now, I can't read Japanese, but this is what Google translated the middle part to. Not sure how accurate that is, but as usual, if any of you watching can read Japanese, let us know what all of this text translates to down in the comments. According to the cutting room floor though, this course is used to test map collision codes such as where Pikmin can be planted and such. Next up is Shape Test, and this is a pretty cool area with the word Yaku plastered all over the place. First, we spawn into an area with several open cans, as well as three otherwise unused models of Ramune bottles, a popular Japanese drink. The textures for each of these bottles is also different. We got this strange teal texture, this one which appears to be testing a reflection effect of sorts, as well as this one which, just like an actual bottle, appears clear. And there's even the little Ramune ball inside of it too, which I thought was a nice touch. This also appears to be the same teal texture that the other bottle uses. Both the bottle and ball texture also appear different here than the Ramune bottle that is found in the forest naval stage. It's unclear if these bottles were once planned to play a bigger role in the game, and it wasn't until many years later where in one of the Pikmin shorts, the bottle concept appears to have been revisited. Anyways, moving on, the other half of this course is like a small pond area. Nothing too crazy here, but man, I gotta say, the resolution of the images of nature used for the background here look amazing. Like, almost realistic even. Also, apparently Yaku, as seen plastered throughout the course, is thought to be short for Yakushima, the file name of the Distant Spring course. So it's believed that this test course, or at least parts of it, may have once been an early version of Distant Spring. Next up is a course listed as Play 4, and this appears to be a large test room testing various things. We got slopes, some little rooms, and even weirder things like what looks like a helicopter landing pad on top of a tree stump. And this tree stump actually uses an also otherwise unused texture that itself also has a section that doesn't even get used here. It's like we got some unused section going on here. 
here we also have some ramps at varying angles, and as you've probably seen by now, most of the stage uses a placeholder checkered texture with a flower. Overall, a pretty slick little test room, but it absolutely pales in comparison to what we have next. The next unused course is rightfully known as Test Map, and oh, it's a test map, alright. Here we got loads of stuff that you'd expect in a test map. Ramps, steps, platforms, you name it. Just like we've seen in other games here on the show, like Super Mario Sunshine, Fall Guys, and more, this area was used to test movement and functionality of the player, as well as other objects on different types of terrain. There's also this massive tower segment, several holes to fall down, these weird red curvy paths ranging in sizes from small to big to extra big, and similarly there's also these plus shaped red paths too. Just like basically all of the test rooms I've got to play around in here on the show, it was really fun and relaxing to run and fly around the different terrain here. And yeah, this was a massive test room. I honestly would not be surprised if this is the biggest single test room on Lost Bits to date. Now that's a tough unused map to follow, but last up we have two unused rooms, Tuto 1 and Tuto 2. Tuto 1 uses the same placeholder texture we saw back in Play 4, and this is another large testing area. Unfortunately though, this one doesn't have nearly as much interesting stuff. Here highlights include several very deep holes that you can fall down, the little ramp thing here, as well as a large elevated platform at the end. I wasn't able to load it in, but as seen here, Tuto 2 appears more complete and looks like another early version of one of the game's courses. Now based on the names of these stages, I immediately thought Tuto is short for tutorial, and yeah, this may actually be the case, but there's a bit more to it. Apparently, according to other files in the game, Tuto 1 and 2 were actually supposed to be areas used for a scrapped two-player mode for the game. Tuto 1 obviously isn't complete, but I guess both of these stages could have served as a tutorial of sorts for that mode. It's pretty interesting that two early stage GameCube games, both Luigi's Mansion and now Pikmin, had a two-player mode that was scrapped. And those are basically all the unused areas left in Pikmin. Although the level of perceived interest was quite varied for me with all these unused areas, as always, I love playing around in them and I'm glad that they were left over. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this Pikmin video. If you did and want to see me cover the other games in the series, let me know down in the comments. But as always, thank you all so much for watching today, and I will see you in a bit.